Good evening, everybody. Hi. How are you all doing? I'm doing pretty good. Great. I'm glad to see you all here. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I, uh, Craig and Pastor Craig and Christy and Nora and Rex were gone, and then before I came back, or before they came back, I was gone. I'm like, where's everybody been? It's been years, it seems like. <laughs> no. 
No, no. I had fun, though. We had fun moving our daughter, so it was a nice drive from North Dakota to Tennessee. Sort of. A lot of green. <laughs> but it was fun. I locked the keys in the U-Haul. I've never done that. That was, that was, I went into the subway because Travis goes, before I was in the truck with, uh, talking to my son, and he goes, I locked the door before you leave, but make sure you grab the keys. Oh, okay. And I'm blah, 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 just talking to Duncan. And I'm like, okay, and I got this new little uh, money pouch that I have <laughs> keychain on, but it's not keys. And I, um, I'm like, okay, all right, love you, son, bye. Hung up, locked the door, grabbed it, walked out, got halfway there, and I'm like, mm. And I didn't have the keys. I had left the U-Haul keys on the uh, console. And I go, and I don't lock my keys in my cars. I haven't done that since I moved here, and that's been 10 years. <laughs> Used to do it in Oregon all the time. So then I get into this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Else, right. So then I went into the subway, and I go, I did something. He's all, what did you do? And I said, I locked the keys in the car. And he's like, yeah, right. You locked the keys in the car. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, really. Did you lock the keys in the car? Mm-hmm. He's like, no, seriously, did you lock the keys in the car? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Taylor goes, I think she locked the keys in the car. Yeah. He goes, you did not. And I said, I did. He's like, Tony. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so it was fun. And the girls learned that the new extra key is a hanger. <laughs> he learned that one. She learned that one. So it was fun. We had a lot of fun. It was joyous. I got to love to spend time with my children, even if it is driving. Anywho, but it's glad to be back. It was rainy and very hot, uh, no, humid, humid there. And they drive like crazy. It was crazy. I swear we almost got hit like a couple times. Anyways, so tonight we're going to be talking about the Portrait of Gallery of Christ. You all have the paper in front of you. And just a little um, bleep, Pastor Rob actually has done this series. There's a big series of it that he does. And this is his um, notes of it and everything. This is what he wanted us to learn and to teach and to talk about. So as they're having fun, enjoying their time, we get to start it without them. So if we can bow our heads and let's pray for the service. Father God, we just come before you and we just praise you and thank you for this chance to come before you and be together as family and enjoy conversation and dinner, Father God. Lord, we just ask that you just have your way with this complete conversation. Let us get in deep into your word and into the portraits gallery of Christ and have a deeper understanding and just bring to our mind anything that we may have missed or may have not seen in the past as we've read the Bible. Bring it to the forefront of our mind and just put us in awe, Father God as you already do, but just let us do that ha-ha moment. I didn't know that kind of thing. Holy Spirit, we ask that you just have your way in this service. We ask that you have your way with me, Holy Spirit. Let me be a vessel for you to use because I cannot do anything. You are all and everything. You're the one that guides the Lord's words. You're the one that opens our hearts. You're the ones that lets us see what's going deep into the word. And we just thank you and have your way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So I was kind of like, you know how I normally talk really fast? And you know how I normally have more than one page? Pastor Rob sent this to me today, and I said, I think there's a second page. It's only at four. Can you send me the second page? And he's like, sure, I'll look. There's not a second page, Tony. Oh. Okay, I'll try to do this and st extend it out longer. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'll extend it longer. <laughs> he's like, you got this. I'm like, ah, thank you for the faith. <laughs> Anyways. So the, um, like I said, uh, Pastor Rob had done this in 2013. It's his series. And I was really intrigued because when I asked him, hey, the book's going to be over. What are we going to do next? And he says, he says, well, we're going to go through the whole Bible and all the people in the Bible. I'm like, oh, okay. So I was looking back at like Adam and Eve. I was going to Abraham. And then he pops up. No, we're going to do New Testament. I said, wait a minute. But the Bible starts back in Genesis. Doesn't it? Last time I checked. It says in the beginning, right? <laughs> He's like, no, we're going to do this one. I said, oh, okay. Anyway, so the introduction, the Gospel of John paints a series of portraits in which Christ is the central figure. 
And the, of course, if you haven't noticed, the author of the book is John. And Travis goes, is that John, like John in the wilderness, the one that did the preaching? And I'm like, mm-mm, no. There's more than one John. I said, no, this is John the Divine, known as John the Beloved, John the Baptist. It's a lot of Johns. The Apostle John, Saint John, it's all one. He's actually the one that they're talking about. But it's good to know that he is actually, and I'm going to say the mom's name wrong, probably. It's Salomon, S-A-L-O-M-E is her name, and the father is Zebedee. And one of the little things that it points out in here is that Salomon, there's two names in that Bible, and mentioned that, two names like that. One is of the unrighteous, which is not her, and one of the righteous, which is her. And she's actually, from what the background of um, the history of this, because I took a lot of this that Pastor Rob has and also did a lot of more cross-referencing, is found out that um, Salomon, the mother, is actually the sister of Mary, which makes John his cousin, John and actually his brother, sort of cousins. As they're married, as he, yeah, born into the family, but you know what I mean. Yeah, but not like by blood. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we're going to start off, I don't know if you knew, but John actually was the youngest disciple um, I did not know that either, and he's actually also um, the last one that lived the longest. Go ahead. that I was opening up and researching this, it was talking about different pictures and portraits like the Catholic Church and, and the Puritans, um, Puritan Christians, how they had painted uh, John and what he looked like. And they made him look feminine at some points, really young as a teenager and some other portraits, all this other stuff. So it was kind of interesting. But anyways. Well, one thing I know he had was muscles because he was out there and walked a lot and he did a lot of fishing. You're an outdoorsman, Ron? I can see that. <laughs> Anywho, so we're going to start with, I just thought that was kind of a little neat thing. Um, we're going to start with number, with A, Jesus' disciples, the son of Zebedee. Number one, John and his brother James were called the, to follow Jesus Christ after Peter and Andrew were called to follow him. We're going to go into Matthew 4, 18 through 20. Does anybody want to read? All righty, go ahead, Ron. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they left their nets and followed me in. How many of you would have actually at that time would have done that when Jesus called you? I mean, you... I think I would have. You don't really know that he's the Messiah just yet because it's not announced. It's secret still because he doesn't announce it. So how many would you, you know, whether it be a cousin or a family member or a friend says, come and follow me, would have actually done that? It was common for discipleship, so they were in practice of... of People coming along, they mentioned about Judas before Jesus, uh, 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 who uh, took up a, a, an account against the government, and he, he ended up falling, falling down. It, it was a common practice, so they, they would have been in the, it would have been a normal thing for people to come along and say, 
Hey, I got in the way. Follow me. Because they were following. Him. I think he had a way about himself to make himself known to people because some people did walk away from their life to follow him. Especially the tax program, Matthew, you know. Yeah. He walked away from all that could be comfortable. He had money. And there was something about him and how he went about to get people to follow him. And I, I think the love that he had. And he could just feel it. I have you know a couple of people that they're <coughs> like not far from not like Jesus or anything, but like my brother, for example, he can walk into a room. Actually he was walking down the street in our hometown. And the guy actually came out of his business and offered him a job right there. <laughs> I don't know how, but I know a couple of people that are like that. They can sell igloo to, or ice to igloos, or to. Thank you. To build an igloo. <laughs> so it's interesting. Go ahead. <laughs> Charismatic. A lot of people are drawn, I don't know about you, but I'd rather be drawn, I'm drawn to more people that are more easygoing and are just more laid back, but have that, not necessarily, it's a confidence, but it's a peace kind of confidence, a warmness of them, mm -hmm. that you know that there's no drama. So, did you have anything, Jean? <coughs> Funny side of that, I, I, I love a fish, so I would have <laughs> I love to fish too. Yeah. Even though I'm just for the fishing. No joke. Can you hey, fill my boat up again? <laughs> he, he definitely had a, a better fish tracker than what you get out there on the boat. <laughs> yes, he did. Off to the right side. See, even the fish followed him because if no fish, you just tell him throw it again. Yeah. Uh, number two, these four. <laughs> oh, go ahead. He knew he ended at 20, but 21 and 22 are the verses that actually talk about the calling of John. Yeah, we go for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you hate yourself now. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta make this last. I gotta make this last. These four were fishermen and probably knew each other well because they were fish. They fished from the Sea of Galilee. Um, John refers to himself as the one who loved, who, who Jesus loved. And we see that in John 13, 23, and then it's mentioned again in John 21 through 20, or 21 and 20. Anybody want to read either one of those? I got sticky so that I don't go fishing for the Bible. I was like, yes. Let's see. John 13, verse 23. I'll read it. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and, pro and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirty. And then John. That wasn't. John 13, 23. John. John 13, 23. Yeah. One of them, the disciples who Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Right. And it says to, to one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. And then verse 21 through 20 says, I was like, what? I missed that. Sorry. No, no, you're good. Because I was like, oh, yeah, OK, OK. Did I write that wrong? <laughs> Choose one of the Gospels, just one. And that, you know, that's what's important. <laughs> yeah, John chapter 21, verse 20. <laughs> I was reading this, I 
first thing I thought of was, because um, mine's the NIV, and it, I don't, and it says, um, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned against, leaned back against Jesus at the supper. And I kept thinking, he just like felt so comfortable that he just like chill, totally just like chilling there. Like how, how can you do that? <laughs> he's the deity. I mean, he's like, but then my brain went somewhere else. So, but I thought that was pretty interesting that he, like you said, against the breast of Jesus. To be that comfortable, to be that, know that you're that loved and that cherished, that just like a father and a son or a father and a daughter, you can, you can do that and it's okay because it's totally acceptable. Well, he was with Jesus the same way that Jonathan was with David. That's right. Their souls were knit together. Yes. And then it goes down to 23. It says, um, A3, A, verse 23 of chapter 21 of John says that John was reclining as we read next to Jesus at the Passover supper. You try doing that at my dinner table, you get in trouble. But he was so relaxed that he just reclined. And then it says, because it goes down, I'm like, why did pastor break this up? But then it goes down, it says, Peter asked John to ask Jesus who betrayed, who was the betrayer was, which she had read. It says, this was the one Jesus had leaned against. We went. Oh, and he says, the latter part of 20, it says, the Lord who is going to be, who is the Lord, who is the one that's going to betray you? And then you go to, in John 19, 25 through 27. Oh, no. No, that Peter asked, John asked, who was the betrayer? So it says it right there in the um, John 21, 20. And I was like, okay. So that's kind of like one of my kids going, sitting back and relaxing and going, hey, Mom, what'd you get us for Christmas? You know, trying to find out the secret that nobody knows yet. But Jesus doesn't point it all out, obviously, does he? Right. He doesn't blatantly say, hey, Tyler's the one you're getting, you're getting a bike, you know. That's right. And then in John 19, 25 through 27, and the reason we're doing this is because we're trying to understand John. Before we get into the portrait that John portrays of Jesus, we got to understand the background of John and how John and, and Jesus' relationship was and is and how he portrays that portrait, how he comes up with the portrait that he has of Christ that we all see in his books that he wrote. In John 19, 25 through 27, does anybody want to read that one? I don't know if some of you know this, but um, John's mom was actually one of them that was at the cross. So it wasn't just, you know, Mary and Mary Magdalene, but uh, Salomon was there also. So to have Jesus tell John to his mom, or to John, that this is your mother, when his own mother is right there, there's some kind of significance to that. And go ahead. When Jesus said that to, to his mother and John, I was upset because I felt so sorry for the mother. Like, you know, this is your son. If she was hurting so bad because I didn't understand that thing. But I can imagine how that would have felt. Yeah, the significance of the, I mean, Jesus loved him so much. That's why he was called the beloved. Mm -hmm. And he wanted someone that would he cherished and loved to take care of his mother. Yes. I know there's mother more significance to it, but okay. until Jesus tells us what that is, I mean, I Got to do more research on it. Because I'm like, how is that? Why is that? Why does this happen? Why did that happen? Why, why didn't he just let, you know, take care of your mother? But as we, we learn later on, 
John actually took care of Mary all the way up until she passed. Well, he knows the end from the beginning. It could have been that he knew that John was going to be on the island of Patmos about 60 years later. Oh. It, could have been, it could have been that, that he realized that all of his physical brothers were going to walk in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and that they would probably be crucified well, long before that. So he was trying to make sure she was taken care of. And John is the only one that, that shows that they, in the biography of John the Baptist, that was not martyred. And I thought that was interesting because I never even looked into that part. I was like, I never thought of that. But all the other disciples had been crucified or martyred at one point, and John was the only one. And John, does anybody know how old John was when he passed? Yes, at least 99, maybe he, he was pushed into the century mark. Hey, that's a generation older than guys like me are now. You know, I'm 72. <laughs> You're a young 72, though, Ron. <laughs> You're a young 72. Yeah, that's what it said in the, um, when I was doing the biography of John, is that it said that um, he was 90, he was 98 to, between 98 and 100. They didn't give an exact date, but they did say where his tomb was. Does anybody know where his tomb's at? It's in Patmos, but it's at the island, because I saw a special on that. It is. It has to be at Patmos, because that's really Yeah. He stayed there to finish the gospel, I mean, uh, Revelation. Yeah, it is. Actually, he eventually returned to Ephesus, where he died of old age sometime after the, after 98, mm -hmm. um, age of 98, and was buried in the modern day, I'm not even going to say this wrong, Selkuk, it's S-E-L-K, S-E-L-C-U-K, in Turkey, oh, where, his tomb, where his tomb is located. <laughs> Which, in the early second century, Bishop Papos of, I can't even say that, Herapolis, H-I-E-R-A-P-O-L-I-S, claimed that he was the one that slayed, he was slain by the Jews. But there's no actual grounds that can't authenticate that claim. But it's in Turkey, and I didn't know that either. And you can actually go see it. I mean, you can't like. They have something over there with the prison was meant built something over it's a good tourist place that a lot of people go where he was. Yeah. yeah. And I thought that was interesting too because I didn't. Because at one point I thought, well, maybe he was like Enoch where he was just away. walked off and that's where the him and Jesus were friends. You know, just walked. Moses did that too. So, but no, he was the one that was. Anyways, I thought that was interesting. I think the way Jesus entrusted his mother to John shows Jesus lost her. Sitting here, and if I'm if someone's going to take care of my mom besides me or my brothers or sisters, it's got to be someone that I love and trust. Someone that's going to take care of her. And it wasn't a slight against John's mother. No. It was, now you have two kind of thing. Like, like a blessing. Yeah. I thought that was interesting. We've already determined, Travis and I, that Taylor's the one that's in charge of taking care of us. Not that we don't trust the other three. She's just the most respons more responsible, more level-headed. Not that you guys aren't level-headed. I'm just going to be quiet. That'll be a first. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, so, um, so we determined that John had given and told Jesus, or Jesus had told John that this is your mother, pointing towards his mother, and even though his mother was there also. And I, I agree with Pastor Craig that it's a blessing because, in a sense, John had two moms that he took care of. I also learned that his mother was very vocalist, vo vocal, vo very vocal, very vocal, outspoken, and very um, driven. And she's actually one of the women that ministered to Jesus. I learned that too, and I thought that was pretty neat. Well, she was the one that came to Jesus and said, "Hey, can uh, this one sit on your right hand? This one sit on your left?" Yeah. She was a little outspoken. Which to me shows confidence and in, in, in her faith and her belief in Christ and, and knew what to ask. She wanted the best for her kids. That's right. Number four. John ran with Peter to the empty tomb. And that's in John 20, 20. John outran Peter. He did. That could be because he was younger, maybe? Anyways, 
John 20:20. 20, 20, after he said this, he showed them this showed them his hands and sighed. Disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Can you imagine the person that you cherish, the person that you love, the person that you would, would do anything for, that you adorn? You watched him get put on a on wood, on a cross, whipped, beaten. You watched all of it happen. And if you didn't watch it, you heard about it. And then you watch them get put him in the tomb. And then you run to go to the tomb and you see him. And then he shows you, look, this I am who I am. This is shows this is what actually happened. It's not a big bit of imagination. You didn't eat or drink anything that's given you hallucinations. This really did happen. It's amazing to you. I mean, I can't even wrap my mind around that fact. Like if, if my mom or my brother were to do that, and I, no, mm -mm. get thee behind me, Satan. There is something wrong with you. That does not happen. But Jesus, they did, like, they totally accepted it. I think it's because in the world now, not that the world was bad then, but now there's so much that's acceptable to the world. More for them, a lot more people doing it. Right. And Jesus, it's like they just, they loved him so much that it didn't matter that he was, they watched him die, and now they got him before him, and he's alive. They didn't doubt any of that. And if that's not an, accept, an acceptance of faith and of truth and righteousness, I don't know what is. I mean, that's just, I couldn't, like I said, I'd be telling my brother, mm -mm, we definitely need to be doing something. Can I ask you a question, honey? Sure. Why did John not go into the tomb before Peter? I don't know. Why didn't he? He was the younger. The elder always goes first. Oh, that's first. right. I know that. It's on here. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> there might be spiders in there. You never know. They keep me out of there. That's right. The important fact about John that defined who he was. Is the important facts that about John that defines define who he was. Number one, Jesus referred to John and his brother as the sons of thunder. And I was trying all day. So these words that I can't pronounce, I've been trying all day to try to pronounce correctly. I even like did the whole Google thing and how you listen to it. But the name that they have is referred to, besides the sons of, sons of thunder, the other word of sons of thunder is Bonergres, B-O-A-N-E-R-G-E-S. B O A N E R G E S. Boner. Bone. Bone. Bonagis. Bonagis. Say it again. Bonagis. 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 It actually um, says he and his brother were referred to as Bonagis, or our reference in layman's terms for me is sons of thunder by Jesus, presumably because of their zealousness and intolerance. These qualities are They were loud. Yeah, they're and they were very they're a bunch of <laughs> irritable if you got them run strung up the wrong way. Like a house full of boys, huh Joy? <laughs> I don't like, get, like being trapped <laughs> into a cave with a mama bear right. in between her cubs. But it was interesting because these qualities are evident in the gospel story in which they wanted to call down heavenly fire on all the inhospitable Samaritan, Samaritan towns that, re, that, yeah, for which they rebuked Jesus. I thought that was pretty neat. So their zealousness and their intolerable to the of people not of how Jesus was treated by people shows, like it says in the gospel, 
And that's one of the traits that John shows is that his hunger and his faith and his belief, it was as if it was in, it's ingrained in him. It was like everything was, that was everything to him. Which is how it should be for us because what portrait are we portraying? Right? What do we portray of Christ? Because Christ is of us. Right? It tells us that we are what? Made in his likeness, right? In his image of Christ, in his image of God, right? So. So what kind of portrait do we portray? What are we doing when we are portraying the portrait of Christ? Are we portraying actual Christ or the world? Anyway, that was one of the thoughts that I pondered today. Sometimes it's frustrating when you know that you hold the keys to life and happiness and joy and fulfillment and people won't or don't want to hear it or don't want to accept it. And it's like, you just don't understand. Like, <laughs> if, you, if you just experience Christ for one moment, Feel you'd, the nev you'd never be the same. Right. And John had that. Like, well, the disciples had it, but John was like... And you wish you could just make them. <laughs> You're right. They all need to be like children. You just make them do their chores. They need to listen. Uh, the intoler intolerant toward... Uh, number two, intolerant toward those who weren't a part of the disciples. So the first one was, you can look up the Sons of Thunder, was in Mark 3, 17. That's on your paper. And then this one is Mark 9, 38. Let me go to that one. And again, my Bible's the NIV. Yeah, this is one that we had to use for our one of our classes for school was the, they made us, we went through the NIV and we had to go through the whole thing. It was really cool. Yeah, nine, Mark nine thirty eight Says, teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. So he basically says, hold up. Jesus, we saw someone Back in the road over there, he's calling out demons in your name. Oh, we laid that down. Mm -mm, we stopped him. Actually, I don't know if that's ad-libbing. But I could totally see John doing that, John and his brother, saying, you're not Jesus. You don't get to use his name, right? But then as we go on, Jesus says, do not stop him, right? For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. But John's tenacity and his intolerance and his zealous for Jesus, he's like, no, he's wrong. Only you can do that. Only the disciples can do that. But Jesus is saying, mm, no. But the desire and the drive to want to do things right, I love that. Because sometimes when we think we're doing something right, we're not, unfortunately. Like me leaving the keys in the U-Haul. So... That's one of the things to catch. Just because you feel that it's right doesn't necessarily mean that it is. It may seem right to you because that's what normally you would do, but things change. Jesus changes things, changes situations. Certain things happen so that there's a better outcome, another blessing that he can give, another lesson he can teach us to teach us to grow, to stretch us, right? Have everybody, anybody been stretched? <laughs> Anybody want to be stretched some more? <laughs> well, Friday night. Definitely come to worship. That is amazing. And God definitely stretches us spiritually. Holy Spirit moves big time. Can't miss that. And then number three, it says vindic vindicative. Nope. 
vindictive towards those who oppose the work of Jesus. Tony, will you really read Luke 15 through 26? No, Luke 9, 51 through 56. Don't mind me, I've only been up for, oh, well, well over 24 hours. <laughs> 951 through 56. 56. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set for his journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Like we've said before, you know, you think that you're doing the right thing because that's what seems right at the time, or that's. Yeah. So it's always important to definitely get your phone out, dial Jesus, and go, "Hey, is this what you meant for me to do? Should I do this? Should I do that?" Because you want Him to tell you what's the best way to go. Because if you don't then you could actually be causing someone's walk to be altered in a way that you don't want it to be. But his intentions were good, right? Well, we're quiet. Well, he was trying to It's not how strong you start off, it's how you did it. Right. What were he was trying to defend Jesus' honor. And it was Jesus didn't need his honor defended. And, and many times we wrongfully will harm someone because they will say something against God and we retaliate by saying something that harms them and Jesus is saying that's not my intention right that, that's you don't need to take offense for me there, it, it'll all get worked out you just need to love people because that's what I'm here for which brings back the whole talking about Jesus and sharing the love Jesus through love. What were you going to say? Nothing? I just find that um, John, that's one of the things John wanted to love like Christ did so much. <laughs> that he wanted to be exemplary to Christ. Mark 10 35 through 37. And this is the request of James and John. It's what the title of my little 